This is Saurabh, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The Weekly Show with Adit. We've all heard the maxim, learn from your mistakes. But what if you carried out things in such a way that you did not even commit a single error? Is it possible? Of course it is. Which means it's all about anticipating things. You know that what happens. Everything that happens every day is just like deja vu. A cycle repeating itself, whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the same things happen again and again like we are stuck on a loop. So when we know what happens, why do we not do the thing we did the day before and therefore we would not be committing a mistake. But then human beings are gullible. We fall into this trap that every day is different. There are different things happening every day and then we don't want to repeat the errors of the previous day and it's the same with this discussion around this pandemic circus that's what it is unless there's chaos there's paranoia around the discussion of this pandemic or epidemic or whatever nomenclature we might attach to it it just doesn't feel right and in that context there is this presumption that work from home is a novel concept well i disagree with this for me work from home has been happening for centuries depending on the profession you have the only difference is that we didn't use fancy terms like work from home or selfie or any other such nomenclature before but the 21st century is all about using such fancy nomenclatures even though the nomenclature we are attaching to is nothing novel. Just like work from home is nothing novel. While the rest of the globe, the rest of the universe still tries to figure out what is work from home and how to have a work-life balance. For me, I had already adapted to the conditions of work from home. And when I was sending out CVs for work or job applications to other companies, my first condition was I will work from home. I have my computer. I don't want to travel unnecessarily and look at my colleagues and have this awkward looks all day. Of course, the best condition was I need an environment I can control and lo and behold work from home but it's not just work from home work from home is a very small part of this huge ecosystem of this huge universe for me it's all about work for yourself irrespective of the fact that we work for some other company, we are eventually working for ourselves. That is how much the avarice is in a human mind. For me, it was all about WFY and BYOB. Work for yourself and be your own boss. That way, I didn't have to burn the midnight oil. I didn't have to slay for others. If and when I want to take a break, I do that. If I want to switch off my broadband, my electronic devices, take a complete digital break, I do it. I don't have to announce to the whole world that I'm suffering from using too much of digital devices. It doesn't affect me. So if I don't use my mobile devices, my computer for a while, it's absolutely fine for me. While the rest of the world talks about how much time one should spend on the computer, work for 20 minutes, take a 20 to 30 second break, switch off the computer or rest your eyes as it affects your eyes, neck and your back. Such frivolous issues don't even affect me because I have already figured out how much time to spend on the computer, when to take a break, when to take a complete detox. We read many articles that 
opening emails affects your productivity i don't have to worry about that my email has been set in such a manner that my emails are automatically sent to the folder they are supposed to go to and lo and behold work from home was never an issue for me working for yourself means that you know you can do other things you are interested in you can write a novel you can write your analysis of sports matches movie reviews any other extra curricular activity though for me these are not extra curricular activities for me there are no extra curricular activities i do what i want to do when i want to do how much i want to do and i'm not influenced by whether i have completed enough work for me i know i have assignments i plan them in a way that i do them slowly over time so that when i complete them it looks like i have done it to its fullest extent and there is a discussion about work from home or working for oneself then the question comes how does one set up their work stations well i have the best work station there was an article that how to declutter your work station for those who are working from home for the first time it's only been 6 months so they are still getting acclimatized to it they still carry the residue of how they arrange their desk when they were working in the actual office fact i read articles in newspapers as well as on the online versions that because of this sudden change from your comfortable office environment where you have the desk the chairs the files and everything being given to you on a platter and when these individuals had to suddenly due to this pandemic had to start working from home they didn't have a good quality desk nor did they have a good quality chair which would help one's back they had temporary chairs and desk at the time the 50% of the world was figuring out what to do how do i get a good quality desk how do i get a good quality desktop and a laptop i already had all these facilities imagine having a printer a landline phone a laptop and a desktop as your work station the best part about all this is that it's your own you're not working on someone else's computer same computer once you leave be used by some other employee of course this is never straight forward it's always complicated according to this article there are some things i agree with for example don't eat food on your work stations have a separate table for your meals i have always maintained that i never eat or drink anywhere near my work station it doesn't look right even if it means delaying one's breakfast lunch or dinner because we are in a meeting i will do that but i will never eat between meetings i don't like it what if i have to switch on my camera and suddenly and doesn't want to be caught napping if the food is spilled on your shirt or on your dress so the second thing this article says is about stacks of paper i have found a solution for that i have separate files for separate work functions that i do so there are not too many papers stacked of course cloud computing is the best but when you are in a meeting you don't want to be shifting tabs from your video application to your browser or to your folders just to check what all things we need what all paperwork is required for that particular meeting you rather take a print out you should have a diary on the desk you may not have enough time to open a word processing file and start typing things there's hardly any time for that it takes more time to type on the computer than to write in a diary and the word debates on paper versus paperless the use of cutting trees and the whole association with climate change for me a print out is always paramount it helps but coming back to the main theme of 
tonight's episode is all about working for yourself being your own boss and that is not influenced by the current pandemic circus the wasteland ts elliot a rat crept softly through the vegetation hanging its slimy belly on the bank while i was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house musing upon the king my brother's wreck and on the king my father's death before him white bodies naked on the low damp ground and bones cast in a little low dry garret rattled by the rat's foot only year to year but at my back from time to time i hear the sound of horns and motors which shall bring swimmy to mrs porter in the spring or oh, the moon shone bright on mrs porter and on her daughter they wash their feet in soda et o se hua dafon chantant dans la hua pole twit 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 jag 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 so rudely forced terio unreal city under the brown fog of a winter noon mr eugenides the simbiana merchant unshaven with a pocket full of currents sit london documents at sight ask me in demotic french to lunch on at the canon street hotel followed by a weekend at metropole at the violent hour when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing waiting i tericias through blind throbbing between two lives old man with wrinkled female breasts can see at the violent hour the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea helps home at tea time clears her breakfast lights her stove and weighs out food in tins out of the window perilously spread her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays on the divan are piled at night her bed stockings slippers camisoles and stays i tericias old man with wrinkled duds perceived the scene and foretold the rest i too awaited the expected guest he the young man carbuncular arrives a small house agent's club with one bold stare one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a bradford millionaire the time is now propitious as he guesses the meal is ended she is bored and tired and begs to engage her in caresses which still are unreproved if undesired flushed and decided he assaults at once exploding hands encounter no defense his vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference and i tericias have for suffered all and acted on this same divan on bed i who have sat by thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way finding the stairs unlit homer's iliad book 1 her gray eyes clear the goddess athena answered down from the skies i came to check your rage if only you will yield 
the white arm goddess Hera sped me down. She loves you both. She cares for you both alike. Stop this fighting now. Don't lay hand to sword. Lash him with threats of price that he will face. And I will tell you this, and I know it is the truth. One day, glittering gifts will lie before you, three times over to pay for all this outrage. Hold back now, obey us both. So she urged, and the swift runner complied at once. I must, when the two of you hand down commands, goddess, a man submits though his heart breaks with fury. Better for him by far. If a man obeys the gods, they are quick to hear his prayers. And with that, Achilles stayed his burly hand on the silver hilt and slid a huge blade back in his sheath. He would not fight the orders of Athena. Soaring home to Olympus, he rejoined the gods up in the halls of Zeus, whose shield is thunder. But Achilles rounded on Agamemnon once again, lashing out at him, not relaxing his anger for a moment. Staggering drunk with your dog's eyes, your fawn's heart. Never once did you arm with the troops and go to battle or risk an ambush packed with Achaea's picked men. You lack the courage, you see the death coming. Safer by far you find to foray all through camp, commandeering the prize of any man who speaks against you. King who devours his people, worthless husks. The men you rule, if not Atreides, this outrage would have been your last. I tell you this and I swear a mighty oath upon it by this, this kept it. Look, that never again will put forth crown and branches. Now it's left its stump on the mountain ridge forever. Nor will it sprout new green again. Now the brazen axe has stripped its bark and leaves. And now the sons of Achaea pass it back and forth as they hand their judgments down. Holding the honored customs whenever Zeus commands. This scepter will be the mighty force behind my oath. Someday I swear a yearning for Achilles will strike Achaea's son and all your armies. But then Atreides, harrowed as you will be, nothing you can do can save you, not when your hordes of fighters drop and die. Cut down by the hands of man killing Hector. Then, then you will tear your heart out. Desperate, waging that you disgrace the best of the Achaeans. What with all the stuff about reverse passes and prop forwards, plus the strain of seeing gentlemen's personal gentlemen appear from nowhere and having to listen to that loose talk about Zulu, Nobber, Kariz. The booster bean was not at its best as we moved off. And there was nothing in the way of conversational give and take until we had reached my car which I had left at the front gate. Chief Inspector who, I said, recovering a modicum of speech as we arrived at our objective. With a spoon, sir. Why with a spoon? On the other hand, I added, for I like to look on both sides of things. Why not with a spoon? However, that is not germane to the issue and can be reserved for discussion later. The real point, the nub that should be thrust out immediately is how on earth do you come to be here? I anticipated that my arrival might occasion you a certain 
surprise. So I hastened after you directly. I learned of the revelation Sir Watkin had made to Miss Bing, for I foresaw that your interview with Major Plank would be embarrassing, and I hoped to be able to intercept you before you could establish communication with him. Practically all of this floated past me. How do you mean the revelation Pop Basse made to Stiffy? It occurred shortly after luncheon, Sir. Miss Bing informs me that she decided to approach Sir Watkin and make a last appeal to his better feelings. As you are aware, the matter of the statuette has always been one that affected her deeply. She thought that if she reproached Sir Watkin with sufficient vehemence, something constructive might result. Greatly to her astonishment, she had hardly begun to speak when Sir Watkin, chuckling heartily, asked her if she could keep a secret. He then revealed that there was no foundation for the story he had told Mr. Travers and that in actual fact he had paid Major Plank a thousand pounds for the object. It took me perhaps a quarter of a minute to sort all this out. A thousand quid? Yes, sir. Not a fiver? No, sir. You mean he lied to Uncle Tom? Yes, sir. What on earth did he do that for? I thought he would say he hadn't a notion, but he didn't. I think Sir Watkins motive was obvious, sir, not to me. He acted from a desire to exasperate Mr. Travers. Mr. Travers is a collector and collectors are never pleased when they learn that a rival collector has acquired at an insignificant price an object the art of great value. It penetrated. I saw what he meant. The discovery that Pop Basse had got hold of a thousand quid thingami for practically nothing would have been gall and W to Uncle Tom. Stiffy had described him as writing like an egg whisk and I could well believe it. It might have been agony for the poor old buster. I have hit it, Jeeves. It's just what Bob Basset would do. Nothing would please him better than to spoil Uncle Tom's day. What a man, Jeeves. Yes, sir. Would you like to have a mind like his? No, sir. Not me. It just shows how being a magistrate saps the moral fiber. I remember thinking as I stood before him in the talk that he had a shifty eye and that I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw an elephant. I suppose all magistrates are like that. There may be exceptions, sir. I doubt it. Twisters, every one of them. So my errand was what Jeeves? Bootless, sir. Bootless, it doesn't sound right. But I suppose you know. Well, I wish the news you have just sprung could have broken before I presented myself Shay's land. I would have been spared a testing ordeal. I can appreciate the nervous strain you must have undergone, sir. It is unfortunate that I was not able to arrive earlier. How did you arrive at all? That's what Puzzling me, you can't have walked? No, sir. I borrowed Miss Bing's car. I left it some little distance down the road and proceeded to the house on foot. Hearing voices, I approached the French window and listened, and thus was enabled to intervene at the crucial moment. Very resourceful. Thank you, sir. I should like to express my gratitude, and when I say gratitude, I mean heartfelt gratitude. Not at all, sir, it was a pleasure. But for you, Plank would have had me in the local caboose in a matter of minutes.
for more awesome content. Tune in to the next episode of the weekly show Vedadatya.